And welcome to FFRS Ask an Atheist. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation in Madison, Wisconsin. And I'm Mark Dan, Director of Governmental Affairs at FFRF in Washington, D.C. So uh, during Ask an Atheist, uh, FFRS Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live, we um, allow you to participate. We're going to have an interview today, very fascinating, with uh, Nebraska Senator Megan Hunt. And uh, after that's done, you're welcome to send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org or, uh, or just right there in your Facebook comments. We also have with us today from D.C., Mark Dan. Hi, Dan. Great to be here. Great to have you. So before we... Um, actually do the interview. I want to show you some cool pictures here. Uh, on December the 21st, which is the winter solstice, the actual real reason for the season, the longest night of the year, the shortest day of sunlight, which is the natural new year, the astronomical new year, a lot of neighbors on our street in right here in Madison, Wisconsin, not at our prompting, decided to put out some luminaria bags. You can see them right there going down the sidewalk. And the whole street participated, and since we have the longest sidewalk, we had to put out about 40 of those, these little tiny uh, tea candles in the, in the, in the uh, lunch bags. And it was really fun. And um, one guy was walking by, and he said, Hey, why are you doing this tonight? Is this not Christmas Eve? <laughs> and we had to tell him, Well, this is the real reason. This is the actual winter solstice, the whole reason for this whole season. It was just really a lot of fun. All the neighbors came out and there were no Christmas carols. We were just all celebrating the beginning of the new year. Did you have any traditions like that, Mark, when you were young or as a, as a non-believer? Uh, no, it was um, not really. I can't really think of anything. It was all pretty fairly quiet and fairly tame, and especially in our neighborhood here in D.C. Um, it's just sort of folks have lights out or kind yeah. of coming and going. But it's yeah, we're much uh, more quiet and we don't have all of that really, really good snow. Uh, we got a dusting about a week or so ago and that's all we got. But you guys have the real winter up there. Well, it's the time of year when all of us can celebrate, whether you're a believer, a Christian or a Muslim or a Wiccan or an atheist or whatever. This this time of year belongs to all of us. So speaking of non-believers, tell us about our guest today, Mark. Okay. On today's show, we have the formidable Nebraska State Senator, Megan Hunt. She represents Nebraska's 8th Senate District, which includes Omaha. In 2018, Senator Hunt became the first openly atheist LGBTQ person elected to the Nebraska legislature. We'll talk with her about being a groundbreaking state legislator, working with atheist stalwart Ernie Chambers, the political landscape in Nebraska, and, and uh, more to come. So welcome to um, Ask an Atheist, Megan. Good to have you here with us. We didn't hear you. Our, our mic was off. Hi. Oh, there Does we go. Work? I got you now. <laughs> it's a miracle. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for your patience and thanks for including me in your in your conversation today. Well, thank you. So, um, you uh, when you ran for the Senate in Nebraska in 2018, you did something historically unprecedented. Well, except in Nebraska, when people run for public office, it's very difficult to admit that you are non-religious, and yet you like Senator Ernie Chambers, also in Nebraska, you, did, did you have a problem with that? Was it a tough decision for you, or was it just a matter of fact? No. My, my perspective about running for office is that the people who uh, you know, represent the folks they serve, the voters should have an opportunity to really get to know those people as they are. And you know, when I run for office or when I represent myself on the floor of the legislature or in the work I do in the community, whatever it is, I'm not going to hide any part of myself. Um, and if I do that, then I'm really taking away the opportunity from my voters and from Nebraskans to make a decision about who's going to represent them. So, I mean, I be myself. I don't hide anything about it. And if the voters don't like that, they don't have to vote for me. Well, so uh, like a big percentage of Nebraskans, what, maybe 20 percent are non-religious and they deserve representation just like everyone else. So there you are. Well, I... 
I don't know. I don't really lead with the, the atheist stuff. And I think that that's actually the example that we should see in our elected officials. The most important thing to me is that we elect people who are qualified for the work. And that's not always going to be an atheist or a non-believer, depending on who the candidates for office are. But because of the way we have centered religious belief in our political process and how we have centered Christian morality in our policymaking in Nebraska and in the United States as a whole, it's really, really difficult for anyone who's not in the religious majority to make their way into the system. So I don't see myself as a representative for atheists or non-believers. I just try to do the best work I can to make sure that people of all faiths, all beliefs, whatever, feel welcome and represented in our state. Great. And if you've got a question for Senator Hunt, ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And uh, turning to the Nebraska legislature, one of the great secular champions in America is your fellow Nebraska State Senator Ernie Chambers. He's someone you've expressed uh, expressed a great deal of admiration for. He's been called a stubborn and yet an effective dissident. And Senator Chambers pushed through eliminating the death penalty in Nebraska and has stood uh, with you to ban conversion therapy, or as he would say, perversion therapy. Yeah. Senator Chambers is leaving the legislature due to term limits. What's the greatest lesson you were able to learn from Senator Chambers? I love seeing this, that picture of us together. I'm going to miss him so much. He's term limited this year, and uh, this is the second time that he's going out because of term limits. So we are really going to miss him, and I really appreciate the example that he set for people like me, anybody who wants to represent the three L's, as he puts it, the least, the last, and the lost. That's who he says that he works for and serves. And so I think that's a great example for everybody. Well, he's been on the, the Senate. Most... He's been on the Senate for decades, right? Going back to the 70s, was it? Yes, he's been in the legislature for over 40 years. Wow. I think he was first elected in 1970 or 71. Um, mm. And he, he changed the whole game from the beginning when he got in there. Yeah. But the most important thing that he taught me... Um, and I got to learn a lot sitting next to him over the last two years, is that the idea that success is just doing what's available for us to do. Sometimes when you're in the ideological minority on an issue, especially as a progressive in a red state, you can't look at success as winning the day. Um, maybe we don't have the numbers, the math problem isn't there for us, and we know that our bill's not gonna pass. But if we make them fight, if we defend our position, if we give it all we've got and we do our best, no one can ask any more of us. And that's how we have to define success, not by winning the day, but by just doing what's available for us to do, using the rules, using the procedures, using the advocates and the people we can organize around an issue. Um, and that's been very important lesson for me to learn because I tend to get like very in my own head about this stuff and I get really depressed when we don't have success. And mm. he's really helped me kind of reframe how to define success when you're going to be in the minority on something. Well, he's been a real champion for all people everywhere. We've had him speak at our convention a couple of times. In fact, we gave him our Emperor Has No Clothes Award. Uh, <laughs> not, just, not just for that Marsh v. Chambers case that he took in 1983, you know, challenging legislative prayer, but also he, he, he sued God in one case. And he's very outspoken. And at our convention, I was singing a song that mentioned Thomas Jefferson. And he came up and he said, Jefferson was a slave owner. You know, should you be singing about Jefferson? And I thought, that's right. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe you got a point there, you know. So very outspoken, very, uh, very uh, powerful. Uh, they still have prayer, right, at the Senate there in Nebraska? Yeah. So first, I want to correct one thing. We don't call it the Senate. We call it the legislature. legislature. Because Nebraska is the only state that has a unicameral legislature where we don't have an upper house and a lower house. We just have the legislature and we have 49 state senators. And we do still have the prayer. Um, the What the Supreme Court decided in that decision that Ernie Chambers was a part of was that we can have the prayer as long as it's non-denominational. Of course, in practice, that's never what happened. It's it's always right. some pastor up there going, you know, thank you, Lord, baby Jesus, son mm -hmm. of God, begotten of Mary, here to save us from damnation. It's always like extremely mm -hmm. denominational. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the kind of stuff that sets norms and expectations that keeps other people 
out of politics that makes people feel like they cannot be included in the civic process. And what do and you, what do you so and Ernie important do? That we push back against that. What do you two do when the prayer happens? Do you just sort of sit there quietly, or what? No, I don't. I'm not on the floor for the prayer. Ah, okay. I so come after where do that. you? Where do you think you'll um, where do you think you'll pick up legislatively where Senator Chambers left off? Well, there will never be another Ernie Chambers in the legislature. Um, we just it wouldn't even happen because we have term limits now, and so there can never be another person like that in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And he's just a singular man. But one thing that I I hope that I can do to honor his legacy is to always have the stamina for the fight that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Chambers famously never sat down in his chair. Right. He was the master of rules and procedure and filing motions and gumming up debate when something bad was happening that we didn't want to pass. And the best way I think I can honor his legacy and make him proud going forward is to keep championing those causes and not give up the fight. Yeah, I think the triple L's, as you mentioned, are extremely important, especially in this day and age, and very worthwhile and to continue in that tradition makes a lot yeah. of sense, and glad you're there for that fight. Yeah. So um, so you said your non-religion was never an issue, and it really shouldn't be, because we should govern by our, our talents and abilities. But did you, or have you experienced any, any pushback or any backlash uh, on, from religious people? Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of that comes from a place of, you know, just really being afraid of people who are different from you. I will say that it's very, very few people. Um, mm -hmm. Most mainstream Christians, I mean, of course, everyone else I work with is in that in that category, but most people are completely accepting, completely kind. Uh, but you do get a few people on the fringes who will email me or call my office or, um, you know, even say things on the floor once in a while. But uh, it hasn't been too bad. And I think that other non-believers should take hope in that. They should think about putting their hat in the ring and not be afraid. Of Speaking of that, we have a question from a member of our audience, and it's from Caroline, and she says, I'm an atheist college student, and I want to run for office someday. What would your advice be to young people with political aspirations? My advice to anybody who wants to get involved in politics is to start by volunteering, and not necessarily for political candidates or organizations or the party or anything like that. Uh, Get involved with community organizations and advocates that are working on things that matter to you that you would want to work on as an elected official. Um, in my life, I've done work with the ACLU, with um, Planned Parenthood, with various like reproductive justice and survivors' rights organizations, um, organizations that help people in poverty. And when you get involved in these organizations and you meet the people involved with them, that gives you credibility as a leader. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a lot of networking opportunities to meet people who are in charge of making decisions. And so you really have to build that experience and credibility in order to earn the votes of the people you're going to represent. Um, don't think about religion at all. Don't worry about being a non-believer. Don't worry about what people are going to think about it. You have to run based on your record and your values and your ideas. And I just think that we need to, as a society, reject the idea that we're going to center people's religious beliefs in politics. So don't contribute to that by making it a big deal. So Nebraska seems like a fascinating state. It's a little bit of a, what would you call it, a little bit of a rebel in the sense that not only is, is it unicameral, but you're also one of the two states that splits the electoral votes, which, which, which seems pretty interesting that you would go one way or the other. And I think in Omaha... Um, the vote for the, in the last election, the vote for president uh, went to Biden, and yet down ticket, there were no coattail. I mean, what's going on in Omaha with that kind of difference of Nebraska voters? I think that Nebraskans have a little bit of an independent or even libertarian streak going through them. Um, we're very proud of our nonpartisan legislature, our unicameral legislature that's just the one house. 
And even though kind of political influences ebb and flow, um, you know, we have a billionaire governor right now who's done a lot of political activism <laughs> from the executive branch. But on the whole, Nebraskans are very independently minded. Um, and I do think that's reflected in the way that we split our electoral votes for president. There are always going to be efforts to return Nebraska to a winner-take-all state. But that would effectively be taking away the vote for an entire sector segment of our population. So that would actually be like a super undemocratic thing to do. And it's really special because when the conditions are right, Nebraska becomes a state that candidates have to pay attention to. And what gives that gives a lot of hope and motivation to people in Nebraska who want to operate on the side of justice and independence and not just give away our electoral power along party lines. And that's what democracy is really about. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we saw that you were engaged very much in the 2020 campaigns. And probably if that system weren't in place, you wouldn't have been able to engage that much. And likely if uh, as the future moves forward of uh, our friends on the other side, uh, our, our Republican friends um, might also want to have a state that brings in their candidates as well. So I think that makes a lot of sense that you're able to take advantage of that position as well. And if you've got a question for Senator Hunt, ask them in the Facebook comments or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. As we turn towards the legislature itself, uh, you've talked a lot about the need for quality child care, citing Elizabeth Warren's story of being a working mom who couldn't find reliable child care. Um, it, for, it almost forced Elizabeth Warren to quit her career and harm her family's well-being. Uh, luckily for Elizabeth Warren's family, she had an Aunt B who was able to come up from Oklahoma and step mm -hmm. in with childcare, in effect, saving her family. Who uh, is or who are the Aunt Bs in your life? I am a single parent to a 10 year old girl, and there is no way that I could do this work without the support of my friends and my family and people in the community. Um, we lived on one of the like busy streets in my district. And my daughter would walk down uh, the street to school every day, often after I drove to Lincoln for the legislature. So I'd go to Lincoln at 7 a.m. and she'd have to get to school by 8.30 and she'd be on her own to do that. And there would be like business owners and neighborhood folks who would text me and be like, uh, I saw Alice going to school. She's looking good. And I was like, thanks for the heads up. And so it really is like a literal village that right. is helping me raise mm -hmm. this child. And I'm so grateful to all the people in my community who, who helped take care of my family. My mom and dad are super helpful. They live a, uh, in a different city, but they often come and help me out when I need it. My friends are helpful. And I think that the fact that I've been able to build a village around my family, it really speaks to the kind of people that we have in Nebraska. I mean, wherever we differ ideologically, um, we do have this sense here in the Midwest of helping your neighbor, of not leaving people behind. And I think the reason I've been able to garner political support, even though I'm very progressive, even though um, there are some, some, you know, I'm I, I'm not straight. I'm not Christian. I'm a single parent. Like there's things about me that should maybe historically, traditionally make it difficult for me to be involved in the system. But um, in politics, it's about relationships. And when people know you, that's what people have to do. Yeah. And that happened with um, gay rights. It happens with uh, any other minority group that you come to know as a person. Your attitudes are different. So... Um, one question that we always get asked as, as atheists and agnostics in our organization is if you don't believe in, if you don't have this moral star of, of a Jehovah or, a, or a Allah, if you don't have a belief in God, how do you know how to be a good person? What is your moral standard in life? How would you reply to that? I would say that if you need religious teachings and you need to be told how to be a good person. If you need something like the 10 commandments to tell you to, to treat others as you'd want to be treated, to not harm people, to not stand in the way of people's happiness and opportunity and success, then I think that's morally weird. I mean, hmm. through, through centuries and millennia, like people have not needed to read a Bible in order to be good people. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a strange question. Yeah. 
Well, I used to be a preacher, you know, and I used to say that without the Holy Spirit, without God, we're all just these wild, evil, depraved animals, and we need the restraint of, well, you know, the promise of heaven or the threat of hell. But non-believers, well, look at there's how many tens of millions of non-believers in this country. Or in other cultures that are that are not Christian, that come from different faith yeah. belief backgrounds. I mean, I I don't I don't criticize people who appreciate religion, who get something out of it, who enjoy the sense of community or the ritual or the tradition, or maybe they use that as some kind of like centering um, mechanism in their life. I think that's great. That's a great thing if that helps you. Um, that's not ever been a part of my journey. Uh, hmm. Faith has never really done anything for me, but I don't have any judgment of people who it helps them. Um, but that doesn't mean it helps everybody. Yeah, yeah. And when we talk a little bit about a uh, moral compass, um, over the summer, it seems um, it, that a lot of times our moral compass was, com as a country, was completely off by some, how some people were vehemently against the George Floyd protests and in Omaha. Um, there was the murder of James Skurlock, and Skurlock, as you know, was a 22-year-old man who was fatally shot by a local bar owner during the joy George Floyd protest. How did uh, James Skurlock's murder change your perspective on life? It's hard to say. Um, one thing that was really nice to see after the murder of James Skurlock is how so many people from different parts of our city in Omaha came together to march and protest and fight in support of James and his family, and all of the other black and brown boys and men in Nebraska who live in the same fear that that could be them next. There are always kind of the usual suspects, the usual people who are coming to the protests, who are holding the signs, who are organizing the rallies. But after this happened, we saw many, many, many more people involved. We saw church groups getting involved. We saw more white people than ever, getting interested in understanding um, the racial division and the crisis of racial equity that we have in this country and in this city in Omaha. And James shouldn't have died. It was a tragedy. It was wrong. He was murdered. He didn't get justice for it. Um, and there's no but. There's nothing good that came out of this. But I am so happy to see more people waking up and becoming aware of the racial crisis that we have in our city. Yeah. I think that one, I mean, one practical thing that came out of this is now I have a lot of colleagues in the legislature who want to work on criminal justice reform, who want to work on police reform. And I think it's things like this that happen that wake them up to the problem and make them take it seriously. So that is a good thing. That's wonderful. Do you think there is an appetite? Do you think that so, there will be an appetite and something will be able to advance in this legislative season? Or do you think a ballot initiative on something that aligns more uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement is possible in Nebraska? I think that there is an appetite in the Nebraska legislature to do something around police reform, criminal justice reform, sentencing reform. And part of the reason for that is because the people are demanding it. So. We've seen two successes here, one that lawmakers are taking the problem seriously, and two, that mm -hmm. the people are activating and pushing them to do that. You really need both parts of that in order to have a successful reform. You have introduced interesting legislation in the past, uh, including um, removing taxation on menstrual hygiene products and that, but what's on the table for the future for you? What are you looking at? Well, I... I kind of tend to introduce the same things because I feel like, well, if a bill was good in 2019 and 2020, it's probably good in 2021. Yeah. And we have to keep working on the things that we believe in until we get it passed, until we're able yeah. to change the hearts, change the minds, get people on board with issues of justice and equity. Um, areas that I typically work on are minimum wage. I'll be introducing some bills around that. Food insecurity, uh, housing insecurity, um, food benefits, things like that. And also this year, I'm introducing several bills around landlord and tenant issues, mm. renters' rights. Um, there's all kinds of issues that I want to work on that I care about, 
But in our upcoming 2021 session, I'm really just going to be focusing on things around the pandemic, um, right. things to bring relief to people who've been impacted. So that'll be my focus in the next 90 day session. Is it all remote now during the pandemic? How are you handling the pandemic right now? Well, Nebraska is one of the few states that never shut down, that never had a mask mandate. Um, we have not had a lot of um, proactive leadership from our executive branch. Uh, the legislature hasn't been in session, so we haven't been able to do anything legislatively. When we return to the legislature in January, we will also not have a mask mandate we don't really have a lot of protocols in the legislature. There was an effort this summer to get us to go remote and to figure out remote voting, but that kind of fell on its face and we couldn't get a lot of support around figuring that out. So wish me luck, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's scary. Well, if it makes you feel any better, we will, we will not be praying for you, but we're hoping, <laughs> hoping you're taking all the scientific precautions that's possible. Yeah, maybe this works. Uh. Yeah. Well, one thing, one thing that frustrates me is like, so our government has been telling in Nebraska, workers, you have to go to work. You can't get unemployment unless you're searching for work and finding a job in a pandemic. Um, we're not going to implement a mask mandate to keep you safe. We're not going to stop indoor dining to keep our servers safe, who work for $2.13 an hour, by the way. Oh. So mm -hmm. I don't really feel comfortable telling my constituents in Nebraskans, you have to go to work and you have to do your job and support our economy, but I'm not gonna go to work for you in January. I have a lot of colleagues who want to delay the session, who want to maybe check in and do bill introductions and then adjourn until we have a vaccine. But I think that we have to set an example for other Nebraskans and say, our government is expecting you to work, then of course the government is going to work for you too. Yeah, hypocrisy otherwise. Uh, That's right. Do you have We've any been more, getting a lot. more questions, We've been Mark? Getting, yeah, um, there, uh, Senator Hunt is extremely popular online uh, today. And so kind of touching on this theme of hypocrisy and when the position of the governor is so extreme of no mass mandates and no pretty much from what you're saying barely any guidelines we've often talked a lot about well telling your story reaching across the aisle but a lot of our supporters seem are saying they've tried that they've tried engaging telling people who they are and it all and it just seems like it's coming up so short and especially in the wake of the 2020 election what do you what do you say to folks where it seems like maybe this is just a zero sum game that's just is not the returns aren't there? I would say that I understand the frustration. That's a big reason that I got involved in politics is that I was tired of having to talk to the same t kind of people who are always in power, who had the same kinds of beliefs, and they knew that their position was safe, and so they didn't have to listen to people like me. They didn't have to take me seriously. And we are going to have to elect new leadership in government if we want that to change. Um, and it's really at the state and local level that you can make the biggest difference. I know that we're all mad about Congress, whatever political side you fall on, no one's really happy with Congress. Um, but it's at the state and local level that you can actually do something that changes things. And I'm not saying run for office, I'm saying do the work and find the diligence to figure out when is your primary, who is running for city offices, what are the vacancies that are open, um, and how are you going to hold those people accountable as a voter? Um, I think that a lot of people feel like the civic process in government is like not for them because it's made up of people who don't look like them, who they feel don't represent mm -hmm. them. And so I don't blame them for feeling like their time is wasted engaging with it, but it's never going to change until we engage with it. And there's always going to be people who have their minds made up about certain topics who are coming from an ideolo ideology that's not going to change. And that's why we have to vote them out. Sounds good. Uh, David writes, what needs to happen in Nebraska before we can elect an openly atheist governor of the state? <laughs> I think we just have to continue normalizing, removing religion from the political conversation. 
I mean, we have to judge people who run for public office on their merits, on their accomplishments, on their qualifications. And I don't think that somebody's belief, what church they go to, what mosque they go to, if they go to church at all, shouldn't play a role in, in whether they're qualified to lead. So I think the more we can decenter that conversation, the more diversity of belief we can have in politics. I mean, I would like to have a Jewish colleague. I would like to have a Muslim colleague. We don't have a lot of representation in Nebraska across belief, and that does a disservice to all Nebraskans who are actually very diverse in belief. So um, we need a bigger pool of people running for public office, and we need to stop putting religion up on a pedestal as a signal or a representation of what your qualifications and morality are. Wonderful. And Randy writes, what's the best thing uh, voters can do to encourage um, uh, politicians to pay attention to separation of state and church policies? Hmm. Well, I, I do think it's very important. I don't know what the best thing voters can do on that specific thing. I would say that the same thing that we do with everything is to have conversations with people, to make your priorities known to the people who represent you, and to kind of be a watchdog on these things mm -hmm. and point it out when it happens. If you can find like an elected official or a representative at the school board or the city council or the legislature who agrees with you about issues of separation of church and state, bring it up to them and see if they can do anything about it. Um, yeah. Well, you use that word uh, watchdog, which is our organization, the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And we hear from members of our group and people all over the country um, who, besides educating themselves, complain. If you see a violation of state church separation, make a complaint about it. And, uh, you know, sometimes we can correct those complaints even without going to court. So that's right. I mean, that's you make the point, that's a really great role that advocates play like FFRF. And, um, you know, we're all kind of on the same team on this. And so we all need to help carry the burden on that. Fantastic. And our last question is, when you look at your daughter uh, who's 10 years old and um, as hopefully you have more time in the legislature, what do you think her future is going to look like that may have been different than yours when you were growing up? I think that she is being raised, not just by me, but by the example that she sees around her in my peers, in her school, in the rest of our society, around issues like consent, mm -hmm. issues like believing research and science and looking at data to make decisions. I mean, I already hear her talking about relationships and talking about um, science and issues in the world in a way that I probably wasn't really talking about till I was in my early 20s. Wow. And maybe part of that is just exposure to media. Maybe part of that is her hearing the conversations that I have with my peers and that influencing her. But I do think that this generation of children is growing up a little bit more skeptical, hmm. a little bit more questioning and I hope a little bit more respectful of each other. Well, thank I you. So. Thank you, Senator Hunt, for your commitment to public service, for your courage in speaking out and being yourself, and for your generosity for joining us today. It was very nice to have you on Ask an Atheist today. My pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I should tell you, since it's here, this is a drawing that Senator Ernie Chambers made for my daughter. So no a rhino is no rhinos are my daughter's favorite animals. So he drew wow. this for her. Yeah, he's a great artist too. People wow. don't know that. <laughs> and he's a, I think he's a barber as well, isn't he? Yeah. Yes, his his background is in barbering, <laughs> and he famously wears a short sleeve sweatshirt and jeans in the legislature every day. And when he's asked about it, he says, "If these clothes are good enough for the people who gave me my living when I was a barber." They're good enough for me yeah. here. He did the same thing at our convention. Most people were dressed <laughs> up, and he just showed up as himself. And we all just oh, yeah. we all just love that. 
Well, that drawing behind you, it's, it's not a donkey or an elephant. So maybe there's a, <laughs> <laughs> maybe there's a different kind of a, um, partisan way of thinking about the world. Well, thank you again so much, uh, Senator Megan Hunt. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Senator Hunt. We appreciate everything. And be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. This week, we are rebroadcasting our 2018 show that explains the winter solstice and examines a legal victory in Wisconsin over an illegally placed nativity scene. You can watch Free Thought Matters on TV stations around the U.S. on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and TV, Facebook channels. And be sure to check out Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast, FFRF.org backslash radio. And special thanks to our show's director, Bruce Johnson, Buzz Kemper on audio, Jake Swenson, and Roger Dalian with graphics, and Bailey Knockbrainer Mackesy, our production manager. And if you want more information, you can join the foundation at FFRF.org. Thank you for watching FFRF's Ask an Atheist.